Hello, everyone, and welcome to RBC at Home. My name is Kim Goff, and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. I'm coming to you today from the museum, which is located on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and the Squamalt First Nations in Victoria and British Columbia. I want to extend my appreciation for the opportunity to both live and learn on this territory. And I encourage you all to consider the traditional territory on whose lands you are on, and please feel free to, land, to add that land acknowledgement to our chat. This week, it is Science Literacy Week, and I'm so excited it worked out because my guests today are from the Britannia Mine Museum near Squamish, BC, and it's on the territory of the Squamish First Nations. The Britannia Mine first opened in 1975 to preserve the material and social history of mining, and in 2019, the museum had a huge redevelopment. And today we're going to get a look at some of that area, including their newest exhibit, the Terra Lab. So to tell us more, I'd like to welcome both Angie and Jess. Hi, Angie. Hi, Jess. Hi. One second. We'll Hello. get your mics on. Angie. Jess, Hello. and we're two of the historical interpreters here at the Britannia Mine Museum. Uh, and yes, just to confirm, we are here from the traditional and unceded territory of the Squamish First Nations. We are very excited to introduce you to Britannia today and to share with you our story as well as some of our favorite spots on site. And to give you an idea of where we are, here is a model of the mountain, Mount Shear. And so most of the mining activity took place up here, but we are right down at the water here at Britannia Beach around five kilometers away. We are also greeted with these fantastic views of at Katsum or How Sound, an area rich in indigenous culture, biodiversity, and a unique geography. And it was, of course, this unique geography that drew people here in the first place in search for a mineral that eventually, when mined, would electrify our world. And so this is calcopyrite. So this gold shimmery stuff here is a copper based mineral and it was discovered here for the very first time in 1888. Now shortly after Britannia mine was born, eventually becoming one of the most successful copper mines in the world. To give you an idea of just how much copper came from Britannia, I'd like everyone to take your index or your pointer finger, link it up with your thumb to make a circle. Now you could make a copper wire that has this width that wraps around the entire earth almost nine times. That is a huge amount of copper. And across the seven decades that the mine was in operation, around 60,000 people made their way up at Katsum House Sound to begin their new life here at Britannia and to provide the whole world with its copper. But in 1974, this mine shut down. But this is not where our story ends. No, because the thing is, is that calcopyrite doesn't just contain copper, it also contains iron and sulfur. Now, when these minerals react with air and water, it acidifies that water, makes it very easy for the water to contain heavy metals and become contaminated. So this is an example of some acid rock drainage, or ARD, and we took this sample right from our tunnel here. Now, ARD is a naturally occurring process, but as the mine grew and expanded, over 240 kilometers worth of tunnels were put into this mountain. By increasing that surface area, it meant that acid rock drainage could form at a much higher rate and was left to flow freely through Britannia Creek and right out into Howe Sound for more than 30 years after the mine closed. So take a good look at this water. What do you think? Well, just by looking at it, you probably wouldn't want to drink this stuff. And <laughs> You probably wouldn't be very happy knowing that it was going into this ocean as well. But the thing is, is that here at Britannia, we like to use science to get a bit of a bigger picture of what's really going on. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go down to our Terra Lab. We're going to do a few experiments here and demonstrate the cleanup process, how we can get that water to a good stage. Now, along the way, we will be pointing out a few of our favorite spots for you. So let's go on. All right. We're lucky there's such lovely weather today. <laughs> okay, so first, take a good look at, at Katsum, the house down. 
Now this ocean serves a very, very important role in the mine's success. It was used mainly in transportation. That highway there, which you probably hear lots of traffic coming from, didn't come into play until 1957. So up until then, they relied on the ocean to bring in laborers, uh, supplies, as well as machinery. But it was also how we got that copper concentrate from the mill to Washington, where it was then turned into actual copper. But of course, the ocean isn't just a transport way. It is an important food source for other marine animals, as well as the communities that surround this area. That is why keeping it clean is very important. I'm enjoying being an armchair traveler and I just get to come along. We're covering all this ground. You're going up and down stairs and I'm comfortably <laughs> here in my chair. <laughs> well, behind us, you'll see the historic mill building. Now, this is my favorite building. Jess, is your favorite as well? Uh, Absolutely. Even more impressive is the inside. But this is an important part of the process that happened here. So once you get the ore from the mountain, you're left with these big rocks. But we need still something to get that copper hidden inside. So they bring it all to the mill and they're gonna to start to break it down into tiny little pieces so we can pull out that copper that's hidden inside. Now, even though this building stands mostly empty today, you can still come and visit and see it come back to life with our multimedia presentation, Boom, which is, like I said, one of my favorite things that we have here to do on site. Now this building stands at nearly 100 years old and a National Historic Site. Perfect, let's right. head over down to the Terra Lab. Not quite as long of a journey this time. We'll just take a few steps over there to get to the experiment. Thank you. And I'll ask, um, I think you can hear me or Laura could hear me, but we'll just ask you to speak up. It might also be a little bit louder when you go into the Terra Lab. Yeah, that's it. Once we're inside the Terra Lab, we will uh, reconnect the microphone. Thank you for everybody's patience. Oh, no problem. It's so pretty. All right. Let me wait. Okay. 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 Welcome. Hello. Welcome everyone, this is our Terra Lab. It used to be called the assay lab because this is where our geologists will come to study the core samples that were cut from deep inside the mountain using something called a diamond drill. Now, when they study that material, they'll determine exactly where those minerals are so they can work to go after them. Now we're going to go inside for our experiment. Yeah, so please pardon the mess. We're getting ready for our new temporary exhibit called Four and Orcas, which will be starting on October 1st. So we're really in crunch time getting everything set up. So if you see things sort of astray, that is why. So thank you so much for your patience as we get ready for that new exhibit. Welcome. 
Meu verso. Uh! Oh. Sorry. <laughs> oh, flappy things are happening. Oh. Oh. Are we, do we need to pause for a Sorry. Yeah, we're well, not. Yeah. Sorry, folks. We'll just get you back on camera. I don't know. There we go. Thank you very much for all your patience again. Everybody, uh, over volume. Uh, how's everybody? Just want to check before we get how we're doing here, and uh, we're going to add the microphone for you. Okay, excellent. All right, so just a reminder then this water here is taken from our tunnel. And already just from the operations, you can tell that it doesn't look very clean. It's full of things floating around. It's not clear. Um, but of course, we can use science to find out what's going on inside this water. And so the first thing we're going to do is test to see if it's acidic, neutral, or alkaline. All right, so I'm going to do that by testing the pH of the water by putting in this drip. So a neutral pH would be at seven, what you might expect to see with your tap water. Anything lower than seven, we're gonna call an acid or something acidic. Usually these are things like lemon juice or something like that. Something that's alkaline, anything higher than seven, we're looking at like cleaning products, those types of things. So we have, so I'm gonna come and show you what we've got here, our results. Oh, I just touched it, that's why it's going to. Seven, <laughs> but it is a five. So yes, we determined that it is acidic. Now, of course, as well as being bad for the oceans, acid does have the potential to carry heavy metals. And again, we're gonna test that with our water here. So what I have in my hand is a copper reagent. And I'm gonna put a nice healthy test of water in here. Now I will let you know that if copper is present, it will turn purple. And the darker the purple, the more copper so, give it a bit of a swirl. Ready for the big reveal? Okay. <laughs> and, okay. So, yes, our water is both acidic and it is carrying copper. Both not good for that ocean then. No, but thankfully we do have a way to deal with or manage this problem. And even today, or what's happening today, and our sort of way to manage this is all of that water is collected up and taken to the EPCOR water treatment plant. And here we're going to replicate some of the processes that happen there to help clean up this water before they take it back into house now. How even still today, they're processing about 12 million liters of water every day. So this is a management process that will need to go on forever. Well, first today to clean up our water, we're going to start by dealing with the acidity. So we're gonna add a base. Now the water treatment plant, they use lime. Uh, we're not gonna be using that today. We'll be using baking soda, which is also a base. So Jeff, I'll let you go ahead, add some of that baking soda in. So we're doing this to help balance out that acid and hopefully we'll get somewhere neutral around a seven or even better we're looking for an eight or a nine. That's where we'll start to see those heavy metals like copper and iron come out of solution. They'll no longer be dissolved so we can collect them all up, take them out of the water and hopefully be left with something nice and clean to go back out into house now. All right, now obviously we're not seeing much of a change through our observation, but what's happening on a more uh, a microscopic level? If you know. Why don't you go up and give everybody a look? You just stir that in. Again, we're just dissolving it. So the things that are happening here are on a molecular level, not something really visual. But now that we've dealt with that acidity, we're going to try to collect up all those particles that we've just from a solution that are precipitated out. Mm -hmm. To do this, we're going to use a polymer. So in this bottle, we've got a polymer. Now don't worry if you're not sure what that is. Basically, it is a fancy word for a long chain. And our chemical polymer today is designed to capture those copper minerals. So we'll add it in and it will start to collect everything together, forming bigger chunks that will settle out faster because they're heavier. Now polymers exist in many different forms. Our DNA is an example of a natural polymer. You might be familiar with rayon, which is one of the more popular synthetic polymers. 
Okay. We got something going on there. We need to add a little bit more. Okay, we can let's really make it happen here. That's more. Yeah. Give it a good stir. Okay. Oh nice. yeah, there we go. That's a nice big chunk of baking soda still in there. <laughs> That's all right, thank you. Okay, and then we just wash. So it can take a little bit of time, but maybe you'll start to see some bigger clumps forming. We call this process flocculation. So it's kind of like a coagulant, bringing those things together and forming larger chunks. Maybe you've had old milk or made buttermilk or something at home and added some lemon juice and noticed those chunks forming. So something similar is happening for us today. Yes, but now can... that we're seeing these particles separate a little bit further from the water, we're going to separate it one step further with the help of our filter press. <laughs> so this works with the power of air. So Jeff, I'll go you get you to dump all of that in here. Yeah, do it. Perfect. <laughs> all we want all of that stuff is there. So the way this works is inside the bottom piece, we have a mesh screen and also a piece of like a paper filter. We put the solution or our effluent in there put the lid on nice and tight. Now this might make a little bit of noise, so we'll be prepared for that. But we've got air here. There's a compressor underneath the table. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna add the air and start to push all that water away from the particles. And hopefully what we'll be left with is some nice clean water and some dirty sludge that we can deal with afterwards. All right. I'm not sure if you can see, but we do have some water coming out the bottom there. It looks pretty clear so far. That's a good sign. All right. Uh, slowing down a little bit. Okay. We'll just give it a moment here. Of course. It doesn't want too much sludge inside. So we're doing it on a much smaller scale, of course, today is a filter press or the system that they use at the water treatment plant, much bigger. And they're sucking out that water rather than pushing it like we are today. But that will stop there. There we go. And so what we have left behind is water that is no longer acidic, it's neutral, and it's no longer carrying this heavy metals. So heavy metals have been removed. And so what happens to those metals once they've been removed? Well, of course, they're turned into sludge. This here is the sludge taken directly from the water treatment plant as well. Now, the best thing about this sludge is that it's no longer reactive. It is inert. So no matter what happens, it can no longer react to the water. It cannot produce acid rock drainage anymore. And so there is a good function for this. And once a year, at core will take this sludge to the top of the mountain and begin to fill in the Jane Basin. Now this can slow the acid rock drain down. So when it snows and rains here in DC, which it does still a lot, then when that water comes through, it's not gonna pick up the iron, it's not gonna pick up the copper, it's not going to be harmful for our environment. Now having said that, this is going to be an ongoing process. We have to continuously clean this water indefinitely. Now we were lucky to get $25 million of funding to build this water treatment plant, which will then last until 2025. But of course, that money will need to be found for a second. Mm -hmm. Maybe before we just finish up, we'll give you a nice close up. You can see what we started with there and then what we finished with today. So much better, I think. Uh, when the mine started in 1905, they weren't aware of all of these environmental impacts that this type of resource extraction would have. But we have learned from the mistakes that happened here at Britannia. And thankfully, what was thought of as a lost cause has really made quite an impact and shown just how important remediation can be and how successful it can be. There was no salmon running in Britannia Creek for nearly 100 years, but in 2011, they did see the first pink salmon run back out into the river. We've been able to see the salmon even this year running into creek, which is very exciting. So it just goes to show the importance and value of doing things like this. 
Now we can do even better by reducing our need for copper. So even though we'll still need to keep uh, bringing out resources and extracting them, by reducing our need, we just have to you know, pull a little bit less out. So I encourage all of you to start to, or continue to, recycle your old electronics. Copper is so easy to reuse, and every little bit that we're able to keep in that system, it's just that much less that we need to pull from the mountain. All right. Well, this was just a snippet of what we often do on site. We also run underground tours as well as the boom show in the mill that I just mentioned. Uh, so we encourage you to come on by, maybe bring your family or come with your school group to engage in some of these activities and wider conversations as well. Now you can book your ticket online at www.ecmm.ca. So maybe we'll now try to disconnect that microphone and if you have any questions, you could throw them in the chat box, or if there's anything you didn't cover that you're really keen on, you can type those in there as well, and hopefully we can get those questions relayed to us. So just bear with us as we work through our technical bits here to get through to hearing your questions. Oh, I think mine's cut off. Okie dokie. Well, we have a, a great question all the way from the UK. Oh, <laughs> why not? <laughs> from a wonderful uh, group of people sharing, uh, asking questions. So uh, the question was, uh, how long uh, does it take to for the copper to reach the water or to get into the water? Oh, like the whole acid rock drainage process. Well, it happens pretty quick here because we've got the perfect recipe. So as Jess was mentioning, this ore that has sulfur or sulfite rich, so we've got lots of that, which causes the acidification. Uh, we talked about how it mixes with air and water, but it also needs a special bacteria, which makes this process happen pretty quickly. So it's always happening. So I don't know that we've had the exact time frame for when you know a droplet of water falls from you know, cloud in the form of rain to when it is actually carrying that copper. But I do imagine it's a relatively quick process just because we have the perfect environment for it here. Yeah. Anything else to add? Well, I was going to say that obviously we also have big surface areas because of the tunnels that were built here, 240 kilometers worth of tunnels, I just mentioned at the beginning. Um, but all of these tunnels have been blocked off now so that we can properly contain that water when it is produced. So it can then get redirected to that water treatment plant and it's just left to go in the ocean. Okay, I'm gonna the mic. Uh, Kim and everybody. Wondering if any we have any more questions. I have a question for you. Um, thank you so much. Um, your I'm your filter made me think of my Chemex um, that I use in the morning to make my coffee, or not my Chemex, my AeroPress. I have a yeah, couple of ways to make coffee, filter. but that's like the AeroPress with the little mesh screen and some paper and you filter out. Um, can you take a pH of the water that you filtered out of there? Did we get to the eight or nine that you wanted to get to? Really great, yeah. We'll see how well the baking soda did. All right. And the polymer. Okay, you ready? I can confirm that it is a seven. Yay! <laughs> so, uh, maybe even maybe even an eight. There we go. That's okay. a little bit closer. Uh, and then we're starting to track the usually the ocean sits around an eight feet point five feet, generally around there. Great. Now you you've mentioned the water treatment plant. Did you how long ago was it built? So the water treatment plant opened in 2005, which was about 30 years after the mine's closure. So 30, 30 years after the mine closed, uh, the water treatment plant was built. What was that like? Was there a lot of community pressure to do that? Was it something that, yeah, can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, yeah, absolutely. There was a big campaign across this area here, um, driven by community groups. Scottish, Scottish First Nations, of course, um, as well as local government. Now, the reason why it took a little bit of that time is the, the, the plans were initially in place in 2001. It took around four years before it actually got the money together to get started. And that was because when the mine companies worked here and operated here, they were actually meeting the environmental regulations of the day. 
And so we then had to go back retrospectively to try and get them to pay up for some of the uh, consequences that their intervention here caused. But it happened, and they did put the money forward. <laughs> and I think the location of this site as well really increased public awareness yeah. because it's right on the side of the highway. People were driving past it all the time. Community is very close to the previous mine site. Because we could see it, we wanted to do something about it. Mm -hmm. It's important to know too that you know this isn't the only mine that's in that mine. So sometimes we need to do a little bit more work for those that maybe aren't quite as public facing as mm -hmm. um, yes. we can increase in biodiversity in the area was another question. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So over the last 15 years, so much life has come back. Of course, we are nothing where we used to be, but started with those smaller vertebrates. We're getting a lot of plant material coming back. As those little things come back, it starts out that food web again. Food for the fish to eat, we now have a healthier ecosystem for them to live in. And now we can see, you know, our Pacific white sided dolphins out there. I've seen harbor seal slots, and you might even get to spot some of those killer whales out there as well. Definitely a more rare site, just given the location, but they're looking to come here and can find those seals, those transient. That's a that's a great result. Uh, there was one more question here in the Q&A from Zahara and she's wondering about the sludge. Can you, um, that you showed us in the jar, what is, what's the sludge? What is it? The sludge is mostly the lime that they use to neutralize the acidity. So they have to add quite a bit of it. I've got a larger sample here. So you can see it's mostly the lime that's used to neutralize it. But it also has some sediment, so maybe it's the iron that's already come out of solution. Iron precipitates out a lot easier than the copper does, but it is mostly what they use to neutralize it. Hopefully that helps answer that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. I and, and then I have a final question for each of you, Angie and Jess. What is the favorite part about your jobs? Oh, I mean, do you want to go first, or? Um, so I just absolutely love being able to, to share the story and bring this place to life. So a lot of my time is spent actually in the underground where I have anyone from as young as two to as old as 100, I'd say, uh, come and really enjoy the story and get a feel for what it's like to actually work here. And it's great to be able to share a variety of perspectives, perspectives as well. So obviously giving an idea of the day-to-day -day life of the miner combined with the remediation efforts and the legacy of the mine there. I am very similar to how Jess feels that on top of all that, I think my favorite part of the day is when I take people into the mill and then I never get tired of hearing people go, oh, <laughs> um, yeah. I feel like I get to see it for the first time so many times throughout the day and it's just a really nice reminder for me of how incredible of a site this is and how we can really utilize how gorgeous it is to you know educate the public on some of these really important issues and the things that we can all do at home that will make a big difference. Yes. Oh that's great uh, and can you say also the second part of that question is what's your least favorite part of your job? Um, least I mean, my least favorite part, and this is so silly. I mean, everything is so wonderful about our jobs, but hard hats aren't definitely aren't uh, usually designed to fit the small children that come here. We are going into a mine. We all have to wear hard hats, and so every time they fall on the ground, you're just looking up in awe at everything going on. <laughs> Probably the worst part yeah. of my day was seeing the hard hats fall on the ground. I say. Um, we like to dress up for our role, which I absolutely love. So when I'm not suited and booted, I look like a miner, I have a hard hat on, a belt and everything, but that is a lot of stuff to get on every single time to get underground. So <laughs> especially when we were doing like three or four twelve a day, having to put on the big heavy boots, overall belts, keys, remember everything before heading out to the tunnel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much. And, and thank you, your enthusiasm for your work and for your enthusiasm for sharing um, science and technology and, 
And I'm really glad you focused today on remediation and how important that is. You know, at one point you mentioned something we can all do is recycle our electronics. There is a great system of return it centers right across BC, uh, making it easy for people to recycle their electronics. So let's all give a plug to them. Um, Jenny, I think we've stopped uh, the spotlight. I'm going to just share my screen here for our little for our wrap up. I want to let folks know that our next RBCM at Home is scheduled for October 19th, and my guest will be educator Hannah Morales, and she'll be talking about the Royal BC Museum's Empathy Toolkit and resources that were developed for Indigenous artists uh, as part of our Indigenous Artists Summer Program. So I hope we'll see you then. I hope people will go and visit Britannia Mine if you haven't been there already uh, and check out their new show coming up on orcas, which you know we love here at the Royal BC Museum. So thank you again, everyone. Take care of yourselves and um, see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.